you very much, Mr. Clark. Um, our second keynote speaker is Lance Price, who many of you will remember as a former BBC political correspondent before becoming the media advisor to Tony Blair in 10 Downing Street. Uh, Lance recently published The Motor Effect, which I have read, and I can only describe as a must read book if you want to understand whether Modi and his plans for India. So to tell us more about the extraordinary rise of Narendra Modi, from Chaiwala to the Prime Minister of India, let's give a very warm welcome to Lance Price. Thank you uh, very much for being here for that uh, welcome uh, and to the uh, previous uh, speakers who I think have got the uh, morning off with a very good start. Um, I was reflecting on the way in here that it was actually just about a year ago today uh, that my mobile phone rang. I was in my garden. It was a lovely warm day right this morning. Um, and uh, it was a number I didn't recognise, but I saw the uh, dialing code was plus nine one. Um, and I've been to India uh, enough times to recognise that it was a call coming in from India. Um, and I took the call. But uh, I'm afraid, and I don't know what this says about uh, preconceptions that some of us might have, but I was thinking this is probably somebody in a call centre in Bangalore about to try to sell me double plays. Given the other reason why I was getting a call from India, and it was a rather crackly line, and it's clearly a, a, an Indian gentleman on the, on the other end of the phone. I can sometimes be rather sharp and short with, uh, with uh, cold calls uh, like that, but I. Just about gave this poor guy enough time to blurt out that he was calling from uh, New Delhi and might I be interested in writing a book about the election campaign that had just taken place in India. So, having established that it wasn't uh, Woodward or Double Basin that he was trying to interest me uh, in, I, I, uh, I said yes, well, that uh, sounds, sounds interesting. Um, I had borrowed the campaign as best I could from here. Yeah, I hadn't been in India during the election campaign. But the election campaigns fascinate me, politics fascinates me. Uh, I've travelled to India many times, I find it a very uh, a gripping uh, country. Um, and one of the things that I find very frustrating, having been a journalist for a long time in, in, in Britain, uh, I think actually our standard of journalism is pretty high. I think compared to some countries, for example, the United States, where less parochial than, than many. Uh, but even so, I was conscious that there had been this extraordinary election campaign, and that actually, in terms of Media coverage in, in the West, they have been uh, relatively little. And we're about to embark on yet another uh, protracted election campaign in the United States. And you can get your bottom dollar that every tiny twist and turn of the political fortunes of the various uh, uh, candidates for the nominations and then in the presidential campaign itself will be covered uh, in minute detail. The Indian election campaign obviously was covered. Um, but in, in, with, with, with far less uh, concern and diligence uh, by, by British media. That's something that I always found regrettable about the way in which we, we, we look at uh, things from a media perspective, but also from a political perspective. Because when that phone rang, I was probably more concentrated on the uh, then forthcoming British general election. <laughs> um, and uh, I was aware that we were bringing in, as we always do, uh, experts from other Anglo Saxon nations. Uh, the uh, sadly departed, the departed Ed Miliband had uh, brought in uh, uh, experts from uh, the United States to advise him on how to fight his campaign. David Cameron had brought in uh, the uh, redoubtable uh, Linton Crosby uh, from Australia to give advice on the Conservative campaign, um, and uh, we have since seen the results of uh, all of that. But I was wondering whether or not the election campaign in India might have had some lessons uh, for us. So when eventually, when nothing happened for about a month uh, after this guy called, I said, okay, that's fine, I'm not really interested. Um, you know, send me an email, uh, tell me a bit more detail. Uh, nothing at all. Uh, so I decided that obviously this wasn't, wasn't going to happen. About a month later, the phone rang again. Uh, same guy and said, uh, this was on Wednesday, he said, can you come out to India and meet me on Saturday? Uh, and I thought, well, it's not fantastically convenient, but um, it's not every day you get a call inviting you to go and meet the democratically elected leader of the largest democracy on earth. So um, I you know, shuffled my air of weapons or whatever else I had to get out of the way, and got on the plane and went out. And, and uh, on that Saturday morning, had my first meeting with uh, Modi, uh, which was itself a pretty extraordinary um, occasion. Uh, 
was sitting in the, in, in the waiting room at Seven Racecourse Road, which is the Prime Minister's office, as I'm sure you all know, in, 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 in the equivalent of 10, 10 down to and making polite conversation uh, with people there. Um, and in came a Swami, a, 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 a scholar, a holy man, dressed in all these robes, um, who turned out to be remarkably chatty. He was giving predictions for everyone who was in the room. Um, he never met anyone. He told me I was going to achieve three great things in life. Didn't tell me what they were. So. <laughs> <laughs> they, they do with your help. <laughs> Well, one of them, but we'll have to, we'll have to wait and see. In his prediction, he was about to go and see uh, the Prime Minister, he saw him before, before I did, uh, was that uh, the Bodhi would be in power uh, more or less uninterrupted until 2032, which is quite a long time. Uh, which I'm sure would have been great news to, um, to, to Mr. Bodhi himself. Um, and uh, he told me, as many people had already told me, what a great and inspirational leader Bodhi was going to be. Uh, and a uh, short time later, I met a man who absolutely agreed with that point of view, uh, which was Narendra Modi uh, himself. Um, <laughs> and in the course of the uh, writing, research and writing of the book, um, I was very honored to have five long meetings, with him, uh, most of them over an hour, discussing principally the uh, election campaign, but also his ambitions for India, and a little bit about, uh, about, his, about his past. Uh, the idea of the book was to look at the election campaign, but it soon became very uh, apparent to me uh, that you couldn't understand the election campaign um, without understanding your own promoter. Um, and the reason we called the book The Modi Effect is because I wanted to talk really about the, the, the impact of one man, uh, uh, or one woman, in this case one man, the impact that leadership can have uh, both on politics and on the direction of the country. I don't claim credit for the title, and my editor, Rupert Blankis, is here in the audience. It's his suggestion to use the title. It was, a very, it was a very apposite title, I thought, because if you looked at India, um, and Ken has reflected on this uh, a, a little bit, at the end of the Manman Singh uh, government, it was pretty clear that that government was on the way out. Uh, the problems that uh, India was beset by, that government was beset by, uh, corruption, uh, sluggish economy, uh, all the rest of it, um, were, were so apparent and it's absolutely clear uh, that uh, the uh, people of India were looking for a change of direction, looking for a change of government. Um, and the India here in the best position to take advantage uh, of that. Um, one of the big questions um, well, is uh, what would have happened if it had been somebody other than Modi who was the prime ministerial candidate? Um, now, in many of the discussions, I, I, I say in the book that there were, that there were a few moments, more than a few moments, in my interviews with him, uh, when I sort of, sort of drew breath slightly and thought, come off it. I mean, he's a great spin doctor. He's a great spin doctor for India, which is a good thing because he's India's principal salesman and he's going out there now on the world stage to sell India. Um, and he's doing it with, with, with great skill. He also sells himself with great skill. And I've never met a politician. Ken Clark is good, who isn't very good at, uh, at selling themselves and selling the cause for which they, for which they believe. Um, and he is absolutely uh, at the top of the game when it comes to, to that, to the, to the salesmanship and to a certain extent the spin element uh, of politics, which is something having been a self confessed form of spin doctor I know a little bit uh, about. Um, but one of the come, come off it mate moments during the interview was when he, he tries to sort of present himself as terribly self-effacing um, and his face is in the hands of the gods, which he uh, believes, or says that he believes, um, and that really he's simply a humble servant of his party and of the, of the country. And he, he told the story of the day on which the BJP Parliamentary Committee, the sort of governing body of the BJP, was deciding who should be their prime ministerial candidate. And he said, oh, I was just sort of sitting at home, I wasn't really paying much attention, uh, really didn't matter to me whether I was going to be the prime ministerial candidate or somebody else was going to be the prime ministerial candidate. And I sort of, I, I mean, you don't say to the prime minister, yeah, right, okay, um, you don't really know what they're saying. But I mean, it was clear to me, it became clear to me that he had been absolutely on uh, a, a focused mission to get himself into the position that he was going to be the candidate in 2014. Uh, and possibly take himself to 
the leadership. Um, and uh, one of the qualities, obviously, of a successful leader is that self-belief, is that self-determination, is that recognition that you have something that others don't, and that you have perhaps responsibility to put that in the service of uh, your country. And I think that uh, nobody felt that in, in spades. Um, and when you came to, when I came to examine the election campaign, um, yes, it was clear that the BJP were in a very strong position. Um, the Modi effect was the difference that Modi made to that election campaign. And then, uh, you, know, you can't rewrite history. I mean, whenever you've lost an election, my party, the Labour Party, has just lost an election quite badly. Uh, some people attempted to, to rewrite history and say what would have happened if we'd chosen David Miliband rather than Ed Miliband, what if, what if, what if. Uh, but one of the what ifs of, of Indian politics is what if it hadn't been Modi and it had been somebody else who'd been uh, selected? Would uh, the uh, election results have been the same. Uh, insofar as you can make a judgment, I would have thought that it was pretty clear that the BJP would be the largest party of the government. The Modi effect was to take them beyond the 272 seats that they had to win in order to get a majority. Uh, and he did that with this unrelenting determination uh, and will that he's shown throughout his political career. And you come to elected politics relatively late uh, in. Life. Uh, one of his campaign uh, staffers described it to me as a 360 degree campaign by which he meant everywhere you looked, all you saw was Modi. It wasn't the BJP, it wasn't the uh, party, it was Modi. The whole campaign was Modi, Modi, Modi. Whether from all posters and t shirts and all the rest of all paraphernalia that goes with political campaigning anywhere. Um, but also those extraordinary uh, 3D holograms uh, that we uh, that we saw on on, on, on telly, where um, Modi would be back in Ahmedabad at the end of a very long day of campaigning, uh, and he would uh, sit in front of a, a, a camera, uh, and he would be literally transported, almost like one of those sort of Star Trek transporter machines, into the market square or the cricket ground or wherever it might be in up to a hundred uh, villages across uh, the, in some of the dark areas of, of India, which uh, uh, they recognise, the BJP recognise, they can only get to through very innovative and modern uh, campaign techniques, including these 3D holograms. Um, and uh, I spoke to one uh, person who'd been in one of these small villages, and he said it was, it was literally like um, uh, Modi uh, almost descending into the village Themselves. And people come from hundreds and hundreds of miles to, 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 to see these things. And, and it appeared at times that he was almost trying to present himself as India's safe. Um, and the fact that it was such a personalised campaign, a very, very presidential campaign, unusually so for, for Indian uh, politics, uh, puts enormous expectations on his ability to deliver. Uh, now he clearly thinks he can do that, and uh, a lot of people agree with that point of view from what they see seen from what they saw of him during the election campaign, from the very ambitious promises that he was making for what uh, could be achieved if uh, India changed uh, direction. Um, and as um, Mario Cuomo, the former now deceased governor of New York, said, politicians govern. They, they, they campaign in poetry, they govern in prose. We've seen the campaigning in poetry, we see what a great uh, orator he is, we've seen his ability uh, to uh, infuse these massive, massive, massive crowds uh, that he was able to, uh, to, to, to get to come to his, um, to his rallies. Now, the question is whether uh, he can actually deliver now that we come to the more prosaic bit, the actual governing in prose, uh, which uh, he's uh, been embarked on for the past for the past year or so. Um, so we have the promise, we have the expectations that have been raised, in my view I think raised too high. Um, I don't believe in political sages. Uh, I don't think that there are people who can uh, uh, and through their personal contribution alone completely transform politics. But just to say that there aren't transformative leaders, there are. 
Um, but I fear that that man who appeared in the market square and appeared in the in, in, in the cricket ground almost as a sort of god descending. And some people talked to him in those terms. They were almost deified during the election campaign. I think that's pretty unhealthy in a, in, in a democracy anyway. <coughs> Um, but I'm also not sure it's very good for the individual concerned, um, uh, especially if they start to believe that they're not a problem. We'll come into that later. Um, but we didn't just have all that hyperbole of the election campaign to, uh, to judge him. We also had his record uh, in Gujarat. Um, and although he presented himself as the great outsider, uh, he wasn't really an outsider for politics because he had been chief minister. Of a very big state um, for 12 years. Uh, and his record there, in terms of delivery, was considerable. Uh, there was a bit of spin involved in that, and of course, there's arguments about all the statistics uh, around uh, economic development and so on and so forth. But it's pretty hard as an objective observer, which is what I try to be coming in from outside, to look at the way in which uh, Gujarat was transformed and not conclude that his personal contribution. Uh, have made a big difference to the economy of the states, but he was promising that he could do the same uh, for the whole of India. And one of the reasons that lesson worked, I think, is that uh, Gujarat had become a bit of a job magnet within India. And there were a lot of people, migrant workers, who were travelled from other states into Gujarat to work. And it wasn't, so it wasn't just the political propaganda that said Gujarat's done well, India could do well. But there's also people going back to some of the um, politically very significant, electorally very significant states like, like Uttar Pradesh and saying, look, you know, they're, they're, there are roads there that, that you can travel on. The electricity is there 24 hours a day. Go back to their own villages and say, why can't we have it here? Um, so you had his record in Gujarat as well uh, to be able to judge what kind of politician he was going to be. At my very first discussion with him, uh, I said, I have to make one thing very clear. I'm very pleased that you've invited me to come along. It turned out I wasn't, still wasn't quite sure why it had been me, that, why it was me that was sitting there. It turned out that, uh, just purely by chance, he had read a book that I'd written about working for Tony Blair. Um, and uh, I got the impression that he felt that his election campaign, of which he was rightfully very proud, deserved better recognition outside of the world. Um, and he was keen, therefore, for a Western writer to come in and uh, write about it and analyse it. Um, I think he also felt that he wanted perhaps somebody um, who could be as objective as possible about that uh, election campaign. And uh, we know that he has um, issues, to say the least, with the media and the journalists. Um, and I think it's fair to say that um, uh, the uh, the media in, 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 uh, in India is pretty, is very outspoken, they are right, it's very impressive. Um, but uh, people take very clear positions, very strong views, um, and I think he was looking perhaps to get something a bit more objective from, from, from a, a Western uh, writer. Uh, although when I was doing the promotion for the Modi effect uh, in, in, uh, in Delhi, um, I, I was struck by a number of journalists who said to me, I just can't believe that you've managed to get to speak to Modi for so long and so often because we can't get to speak to him at all. Um, and one of the remarkable things about the election campaign that impressed me as a former spin doctor, uh, whether it impresses me as a sort of genuine believer in democracy, I'm less sure, was, was, his, was his ability to dominate the agenda day after day after day, extraordinary ability to make news. Uh, and but to do it, by keeping journalists, or, uh, as well as keeping journalists, at uh, arm's length most of the time. Uh, he took the view, uh, which a lot of uh, politicians, I'm sure, in this country would love to take, um, that uh, journalists were just basically a sort of uh, worried, tedious sort of burden that we have to put up with uh, from time to time, and not be necessarily have to engage with on a day-to-day -day or hour-to-hour -hour basis. Uh, very different to the way in which we conduct campaigns here. And he took the view that if, if journalists wanted to write about him, they could go to his rallies, they could report what he said, and crucially, they could also report what he was saying on social media. <coughs> and, and one of the extraordinary things about the 2014 election campaign was that uh, it combined very, very traditional forms of campaigning, which I'm told were dying out in India as they were happening elsewhere. For example, the public meeting. 
Uh, and the fact that this man was able to get people to travel in vast numbers over mm -hmm. very long distances to actually hear a politician speaking in stunt was itself something of an achievement. But at the other end of the spectrum was his use of new technology. So I talked a little bit about the uh, 3D holograms that he was using. I'm not sure that would be entirely successful if we tried to replicate it here. The idea of David Cameron or Ed Miliband being sort of transported into, um, into High Wycombe. Uh, uh, um, uh, outside sales business, I'm not sure it would work here, but it worked better, it spectacularly well. But what also worked better was his recognition that social media, even in a country like India, which has relatively low internet penetration compared to Western devices, uh, could be enormously, enormously effective. I spoke to a guy from, uh, from a sort of internet startup who'd gone to uh, Rajiv Gandhi uh, about three years ago and said, Look at all this stuff that we could do for you. In an election campaign. And uh, they thought Rajiv Gandhi, younger generation, you know, possible leader of the future, would be lap it all up. Gandhi sent this, this guy away with three images saying, Indian politics isn't like that, isn't like that. I understand Indian politics, he said, and gave him a long sort of socialist speech about people and, and what they do. And, and this guy was rather well disappointed, so he then, a uh, meeting was arranged with uh, Modi. Modi said, Yeah, look, just give me as much of this as you can give me. Um, and it paid off in spades because although uh, in a sense Gandhi was right, an awful lot of people in India don't have any access to the internet, but the younger generation do, and smartphones uh, that we heard about earlier, uh, most of the kids now have got them, many of them have, and they talk to their parents and they go back to their the weekends and talk about what's going on with their social media. And he used, I think both use social media far better that I've seen it used either in here or in the United States in an election campaign. So there are lessons, as I suggested there might be earlier, there are lessons that we can learn for how politics can be done. So the other big question is, is all this stuff about Modi, is everything he was doing on campaign, is the Modi effect, is it all myth-making by a guy who likes to promote himself, uh, who likes to present himself as uh, the country's saviour, or is there more substance to it than that? What, what's the real Mr. Modi all about? Um, and I found as a journalist, um, I first met Ken probably over 30 years ago when he was working for, 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 for Margaret Thatcher. Uh, I was a political correspondent at the BBC, I interviewed uh, Margaret, I still interviewed Mr. Clark several times, and the question you're always asked, uh, and now I went on to work for Tony Blair, subsequently, the question you're always asked is, what are they really like? Um, and, and very often the answer is they're pretty much like they get to be on the, on, 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 on the, on the television. Um, in, in Modi's case, Modi, I found the hardest politician to read of any politician I've ever met. I find him an absolutely <coughs> extraordinary character, but a very, very enigmatic character. As well. Um, he is utterly, utterly devoted to the job. He never takes a holiday, he never takes a day off. He's up at five o'clock in the morning, he usually goes to bed at uh, half in the night, in the same way that Margaret Thatcher was told he used to do, but get, get away with sort of five hours, five hours sleep. But even Margaret Thatcher had a holiday occasion, or do something outside of work. He appears to do nothing but work and have no interest in doing uh, anything but work. Um, and I wonder about that, and of course he's a teetotal, uh, celibate, vegetarian, which would be quite a hard sell as a political leader in the <laughs> <laughs> yes. But uh, not so in the And when I said to some of his staff, I mean, surely at some point he must just want to put his feet up and watch some rubbish on the telly or do something, or, or you know, go to a cricket match or anything other than politics. You can't work on them. And this guy said, no, he does, he does. And if you think about it, a lot of Indians have to work from the moment they wake up in the morning to the moment they go to bed at night. And that is, uh, he's just not living. He, he, he is a hard worker. Now, is that part of the myth? Or is it really uh, the man uh, who is now, who's now leading um, India? The early first year, just over a year, we've now had of him as Prime Minister. Uh, he would argue that's too short a period to make. Judgment. You can obviously only make preliminary judgments. Uh, it seems pretty clear to me that he has made some interesting first steps. 
Some of them, I fear, more spin than substance. So we've seen some high-profile launches of, for example, the Clean Up India campaign. Um, but uh, it will take a long time before that delivers the kind of tenderness that he's spoken uh, about. Uh, I was in India uh, on the day of his first uh, Independence Day speech in August, um, and I found it quite an extraordinary speech actually, um, because here was a candidate of the of the right, um, and in our very first meeting, I did say to him that you, you, read, you know I'm sort of on the left. But Politics and uh, you know, work, you know, my, my politics is centre left. But I said in the book that if I had a vote, I probably wouldn't have voted for Modi. He's not my colour of uh, politician. Uh, he said that's fine, that's fine. And, and uh, he also said, crucially, you can criticise me as much as you like because I had to establish that I was going to be as independent uh, as I possibly could be in the assessment that I was making. Um, so here I was, sitting in, uh, in front of the Red Fort, as he delivered this uh, really quite remarkable speech. Remarkable because, unlike most political speeches of that kind, in which extol the virtues of the government and of the country and all the rest of it, uh, he actually talked about India's underbelly. He talked about India's shame. He talked about the filth of the country. He talked about the uh, appalling position faced by many women in the country, whether it was female security, uh, whether it was female feticide. Uh, he talked about the lack of toilets, which in turn led to uh, a particular risk of women, how do they go out into the fields rather than having to the toilets and to use in their, in their communities. He was willing to address uh, the real, real challenges. And that, I think, is a really important first step. He recognises the scale of the challenge. He's clearly a very pro-business uh, uh, minister and leader. Um, but if I'm right, and I hope I am, he supports business because he wants business to support the country. But supporting the country is not just about making money for themselves. It's about making sure that that money that is generated in the country is used for the good of all the people. And he has gone out there and said to business, yes, I'll make it quite easier for you if I can, but I want you to build those toilets and those schools. And I want you to get involved in cleaning up the Ganges, and I want you to get involved in cleaning up India. Um, and uh, I'm not going to be satisfied uh, until you do. Um, now, his relationship with big, big business is controversial. There was a lot of big business support for his campaign. Uh, Indian politics, one of the faults I think of Indian politics is its lack of transparency over the, over the money side of it. Whereas, so on a, on, a, on a very local level, every single pencil uh, has to be accounted for uh, in candidate's expenses. Um, and we know that he was a former child and a former tea seller who, who uh, has risen to become uh, Prime Minister in one state in Uttar Pradesh. They tried to argue that even giving a cup of tea to voters, which was part of his sort of way of campaigning, could be considered a bribe. Fortunately, that one was, was thrown out. But, but on the ground level, it's very strict. At the national level, parties can spend what they like and they don't have to say where that money came from. And I think there's a problem with that. Uh, and I think you have to be pretty sure people who pay the bills aren't then expecting something in return. And all we have to guard against that is Moe's assurance that he doesn't give favours to those who have supported him in the past. And as yet, there's been no evidence that he has done that. His financial backers, the big companies who have supported him, have done pretty well, um, and he's made life easier for them. But uh, I agree with the view that White Man Lansing, who clearly wasn't a, a corrupt uh, politician, I don't think he was a corrupt uh, I, uh, nor is he a magician, uh, nor is he a god. Uh, he's not uh, uh, the one man who can turn India around. The question is whether he can be a catalyst for the climate change he recognises is necessary. And there I think the signs are quite good. If he doesn't believe his own myth about how powerful he is, uh, how he personally can uh, right all of India's ills. If he recognises that what his real skill is, is to harness uh, the, uh, the ability of others to make real change on the ground, then I think he stands a good chance of 
success, and perhaps that is what we should judge him against. Uh, if you judge politicians simply against their stump speeches and the promises that they made, if you judge Modi against the promises that he made during the 2014 campaign, you cannot other than fail. Uh, he, the expectations he raised were so uh, enormous. He talked about every single Indian having uh, a puff at home uh, within the next 15 years or something. Maybe you can do that. Maybe you can. But what he can do be is a, is a, is a, is a catalyst uh, for change. And I think within his personality, part of the Modi effect is a determination to be exactly that. And the, the, the final chapter of the book is called The Indomitable Will, um, which is actually a quotation from Mahatma Gandhi, which uh, sometimes uh, Modi likes to compare himself to. He likes to compare himself to some, some, some great leaders. He likes to compare himself to. Uh, some British leaders, uh, I think there are bits of Tony Blair that he would like to see himself uh, as being a great moderniser. He certainly likes to compare himself to Margaret Thatcher uh, as a person from very uh, humble uh, beginnings uh, who uh, worked his way up through hard work for leadership of his party and eventually took leadership of his uh, country. Uh, and he shares a uh, lot of her uh, beliefs in the need for some radical change to shake the country up. Um, like the final chapter of the Indomitable Will, uh, Gandhi said that real success uh, in life and in politics lies uh, principally on an indomitable will uh, to succeed. Uh, Modi has that uh, indomitable will. Um, I share the concerns of those who feel that the first year has been a sluggish start in many respects. The first budget was a disappointment. Uh, that uh, the uh, pace of change has been too slow. Uh, when I last met him, which was just after the book came out, he said, I've got to get the building blocks in place, I've got to sort out, I've got to sort out the uh, bureaucracy, I've got to get the uh, systems in place before I can start to uh, deliver. Um, people are, people are, uh, are relatively patient. They've given him a year, they've given him a couple of years. But I think he has to demonstrate fairly quickly uh, that the pace of change that he stepped up, uh, that promises that he made weren't just uh, promises. Uh, and if he does all of that, uh, then he can be uh, a truly transformative, one of those few politicians uh, internationally who can change the world and change the game. Uh, and if he does that, then the movie effect, I think, will be a very good thing to